you know, I can't think of an independent movie that lives up to its name more than DJ Hound Dog. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I am pleased to have on the show today, director, actor, filmmaker, all around indie film. I would say an indie film legend at this point, especially having run into you at film festivals in the past. John Jacobs, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. Cheers, Chris. It's great to be here. And, uh, <laughs> well, it's a key because I know we can't really have this conversation if I'm not you know, in character to some extent. Well, that's true. I mean, the, I mean, look, DJ Hound Dog lives, if, you know, it's aptly named. It's a movie that like the title lives, it lives up to the title for sure. Um, let's talk about where this project came from. And you are the lead character in this film. Uh, you're an actor uh, with a, a prestigious career, uh, you know, from London originally and, and um, you're, this film, DJ Hound Dog, is kind of an indie film classic. Um, it's 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 become. Tell us how, how did you develop this project? Where did it come from? Well, I okay. So it was just after nine eleven, and I had finished uh, this other movie, Lucinda Spell, and I just sort of finished the whole distribution, going to film festivals, doing everything I could to. Um, you know, get, you know, get it to, to break out. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, there was one review <laughs> that I got in entertainment weekly where the journalist said, you know, yeah. And John Jacobs is spreading his questionable talents too thin. And, you know, it's, it's always that review that kind of resonates the most. You're like, what? So I, um, you know, I, I kind of had to think, well, what do I really, what am I most passionate about? And I really am extremely passionate about acting in movies, but I, I'm just a guy that, you know, just wants to make it happen, not somebody that wants to go looking for it. So I bumped into this guy, um, James Ricardo on IMDb and, uh, and, you know, I think he'd hit me up or something after hearing about Lucinda Spell. And, and I said, well, I'm not really making anything right now unless you got something that's set in one room. And then he said, yeah, I got this story about this guy. He, it's, I think it was called Porn Hound. And it was this guy and three girls. This guy never left his house. All he did was watch porn. And I'm like, okay, well, that's actually, you know, I love it because it's like a bedroom farce. Um, but I'm not really ex excited about the idea of, you know, the porn hound exactly, but I just moved to Miami and I was seeing billboards for DJs everywhere. So DJs were like, were so famous and yet they were unknown outside of Miami. And I thought, well, what if he was a DJ and he had all these girls in and out of his room. And then once in a while we'd go out and shoot some footage in a club, that would be a good micro budget movie. Well, it's, I mean, it certainly looks big budget just from the standpoint of, I mean, you have access to all these clubs uh, you, and, and the, the DJs, I have to ask about the DJs that are in the film. Are they, they're all real DJs, right? Are they? Yeah, they're all, yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's where it sort of took on a life of its own immediately. So it was going to be a $10,000 movie. And then I got my old friend Charlotte Lewis to play one of the girls and so it suddenly, you know, cost me a little bit more, right? Mm. As that happens, um, you know, but, but, uh, but once we're out, on, we're out generating excitement in Miami and trying to get access to the locations, that's when, you know, people started to, you know, feel like, hey, this could be the movie that captures, you know, some of the, 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 the rising stars. Well, it, 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 I mean, it, it definitely works in terms of like the party vibe. I mean, what I know about you, cause it seems like every time I run into you mm -hmm. at like some festival event or some indie film gathering, I, you know, I wish I could partake. It's a little early for me at the moment, but <laughs> you're still but, recovering from your lychee teenies, right? Oh uh, yes. Hey, wait, I, yeah. you must follow, you must follow I, me on Instagram, right? Yeah. Like, and I, I didn't comment because I thought I'll save it for now, but I'm a big Lai Chitini fan. 
Oh my God. Well, they, they have, there's this bar that's near me. It's Equator by Edwin Mills in Pasadena. It's like mm -hmm. walking distance from my place. And they've got a really good happy hour that it's like an all day happy hour on Tuesdays. So you caught me. So $3 uh, light chitinis. <laughs> well, I get a $5 light chitini um, in, on Third Street at a place called Rabata Genial. It's with soju. Is yours oh, with, yes. Is, well, that's is, a... it, is it with sake? Oh wow! That's... Anyway, we but, can talk. We can talk drinking. <laughs> yeah. We can talk drinking and partying all day. Um, but the one thing is, is that like you really captured that vibe, that like sort of like that energy of. I mean, it really is like this character. It's like a character study, also like slice of life, but also like this. You know, the 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 foibles of the guy that's basically a piece of you at the very least. Um, I really do need to compliment you on the your your female cast is exceptional uh, in this film, and the fact that like also like I was just having this conversation with um, a producer Paul Fishbein. Um, he made a documentary called uh, History of Nudity in the Movies, and we talked about how that there are so few adult films. And by when I say adult film, I right. mean an a, you know, not a pornographic movie. I'm saying a film that treats adult relationships like adults. You know what I mean? Like, like, like people, you know, exploring that. A friend of mine said, he, a, a friend of mine said that the reason you don't see sex at the movies anymore is because millennials can't fuck. That's what he told me. He said, millennials don't know how to fuck. I don't know. I can't, I, mm -hmm. I don't know how much truth there is to that. I mean, I've had a long time girlfriend. All I'm saying is, that I, I miss there being an adult film that explores relationships in a very honest way. It's the, the nudity, the way that you use it is not exploitative. It's not like, yes, there are sex scenes, but it's, they don't go on and on and on. They're just, if someone's naked, it's matter of fact. And it's kind of how it would be in real life. No one soap opera style has the sheet up to their chest, you right. know. Which so I can't I, stand, you know. Okay, I can't say that either, but can I, you talk about those scenes? Well, yeah, I love that you bring this up because I, you know, I actually, you know, get criticism from my wife actually about my movies because she's like, no, oh, sex and the sex again. I'm like, honey, look, I grew up in, in London, okay? We used to watch what are called continental movies on TV late at night, midnight movies. Often they were French. And, and the French sensibility was to have always the nudity was very natural. And it made, as an audience, you know, especially growing up in England where people are uptight, it kind of liber was liberating to see people uninhibited. And so I, in addition to that, I don't believe in violence. You know what I mean? It's like I always, I, I grew up at a time where, you know, we're like recovering from the Vietnam War and, you know, it's like you got to try to do something to not perpetuate it, right? Watching movies like Gandhi. So I didn't want to be a movie star, an actor that's like famous because he's killing people all the time. And I guess I gravitated as an alternative to having sex in my movies and, and, and aspiring to, to, type, to do great sex scenes. Okay, and it's, I mean, it's kind of funny, but my inspirations were, you know, one in particular, Turkish Delight with Rutger Hauer, directed by Paul Verhoeven. I mean, I don't know, man, there's just something about that that's so, it's liberating, and it's, it, it's, it's, it makes you want to have good sex, you know what I mean? So, so that's something that I've tried to do with all my movies, and sometimes it's hit and miss. Right, but it's cheaper than setting up elaborate gun scenes, and and in a way, it's more real. I've never killed anybody, you know what I mean. So I don't have it, you know. <laughs> so I love the challenge of it, right? And the Lucinda's spell was a bit of a disappointment to me because the sex scenes were not what I wanted them to be, um, and I got criticized, you know. What was it, Neil? <laughs> You know how that. Uh, anyway, but critics soft core <laughs> pillow. So, Village Voice called it soft core pillow core mishmash, right? And I'm like, fuck, I, 
that's I didn't want to do that. I'm I'm upset about that. So with Hey DJ or D DJ Hound Dog, I wanted to kind of nail it. That's that's really the bottom line. Well, it, it it's I mean there are different kinds of sex scenes. I mean, there's a, the, your sex scenes are part of the story, right? Because you get in the midst of uh, two women who are in a relationship. So there's there's that interplay happening and and sort of the um, in a way kind of a sexual politics of them, how they're using sex um, and and how they're uh, I, I feel like I feel like what I like about DJ Hound Dog is that the women are not traditional women that you would right. see in a film. They don't act like traditional women. They actually act like some women that I know. Right. They're like, real. like they are very they're real. real. Yeah. They're real, like, and mm -hmm. and so that's what makes it work. It's not like the playing the, you know, where, you, you know, it, it's this mostly comes from Hollywood movies, cliches and tropes, and the way that the the women are, they're they're real, they're real women, they're fully formed adult women making adult, and that's what I think. I got to get better internet. I don't know why this thing is cutting out. Whether you're listening to this or watching this, I gotta—I don't know if I cut out for you, but I'm um, a little frustrated. Credit. Anyways, credit. And you know they're very exotic and they're powerful. Each one of those women were powerful. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and that's yeah. I mean, that's why I cast them, and I was. You never know how it's going to play out. Like, for example, as proud as I am of, of Lucinda's spell, I wasn't thrilled with the love scenes. I just didn't feel there was the commitment and and the the, the willingness to just let it go, right? And and so, yeah, and these were women that also were very comfortable and with their sexuality in a, in in who they are, and they were able to express that. Um, and, and it, but again, it's not something that, you know, you know, a hundred percent going in that that's going to play out, right? It's something that you're kind of navigating and as you make the movie and as you, you know, work with the actors and you, you're sort of, you know, it's tricky. I mean, there was a lot of, um, dynamics with the, with the, with the actresses <laughs> offset, you know? But it was, but it, you know, I'm really proud of it, and I'm so proud of them. And I'm really, actually, I love that this is something that, that you know, that stands out and 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 is relevant to you. You know. Well, so I'm glad cool. also. I'm glad also that it's on Amazon Prime, so that you can just as an Amazon. That that a lot of people don't. You know, we think to go to Amazon to get an HDMI cable, which I've done, but it's also, um, and the amount of content that Amazon has acquired and put into its system for free, um, is amazing. I'm, I'm just blown away at the docs and, and indie films that I've discovered on the, you know, free for prime members of which DJ Hound Dog is one of them. Right. So, well, that's so, a critical thing. I mean, okay. On that front, I've been, as you know, as we said, I mean, I've been in it from uh, almost as long as you. I think you started your magazine around 84, 85. 85. I was, I was out of yeah. high school. Yeah. I was already acting, but I didn't make my first short films till actually around the same time, right? But I've been involved in trying different distribution marketing strategies from, you know, the early 90s. And, um, you know, Amazon is... Is in, okay, I've had movies that I've busted my ass and died for and then couldn't get into Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, it was just, it was so heartbreaking. And, and actually, it, it pissed me off because I, the, whoever their, their you know, uh, curators were, I felt that they, they really, they were pandering to somebody out there. Well, I mean, why why do, you, why do you think that Blockbuster is out of business now? Don't you? Don't you? Right, yeah. It's, it, it, What's funny, you don't think you think about the Blockbuster days, but Blockbuster was a, you know, they were a gatekeeper in the sense that I worked at an independent video store in high school and even through part of college called Thomas Video or Thomas Film Classics, which was regionally 
really was well known for just carrying crazy. I mean, they carried pornography. They had a little back room where they had porn and they carried all types of porn too. Um, they also uh, carried independent films. And the, the thing that Blockbuster, the sort of way that they kept movies out of their system was that they only carried movies that were rated by the MPAA. Mm -hmm. So it had to be rated. You had to get an R rating. And they, they declared at the time, no one uses this rating anymore. NC-17 was a rating. And that was like, well, we don't want any NC-17 movies or anything that's unrated by the MPAA. Although technically speaking, exercise videos aren't rated by the MPAA or other types of reality videos at the time. So it was kind of BS. But we thrived at Thomas Video and Thomas Film Classics. Uh, a little shout out to Gary Reichel and Jim Olensky who uh, mm -hmm. tolerated me uh, throughout my illustrious career there. But we had indie films. We carried movies like Liquid Sky, David Lynch movies. Like, like it was just like if it was weird or a midnight film or a foreign film, you know, like El Topo, we had it. You know, we had a VHS copy of it. So, I, you know, fuck Blockbuster. I, I think that a lot of people have great memories of them. My memory was is that they didn't have any of the movies that I liked. They only had mainstream yeah. bullshit. So... Uh, and it made so, it so difficult for for us filmmakers to exactly. then recoup or or reach the audience we wanted to, and or at least that we wanted to try to reach. Exactly. And Amazon, and you know, it's evolved over time. Netflix actually has evolved out of the picture for me um, yeah. because they're curating, and Amazon has become the place. I mean, we can put our movies up there. Anybody, it's it, it is the blockbuster for our times. And, uh, you know, this is my first movie ever on Amazon that I've, the, the, it's one with the, that I produced. And I just decided actually just literally a couple of days ago, I'm like, fuck it, I'm going Amazon Prime. You know, let's have no barrier to entry, nothing. It's like, if you hear about this movie, there's 130 million Prime accounts in America. If you hear about it and you wanna have like some, liberated fun right it's there for free well it's also what's interesting is there are more people who have amazon prime accounts in america than vote mm -hmm. so <laughs> right so what so does that tell you why dj handog <laughs> no i'm kidding i was gonna well yeah but but um so so let's talk about it like how does it feel like in retrospect now that like um, I mean, this movie is now finally seeing, you know, a wide, at least a wider audience, access to a wider audience now via Amazon. Um, what, how, what, what is that like now? Because the movie is, the movie originally came out in, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was it 2013, 2014? No, no. Okay. It was finished in 2005. Okay. Oh, wow. It was released in Europe. Started li literally my exec co-executive producer, executive producer, who was actually a DJ that came on board at the very end and said, hey, here's a hundred grand. Let's go shoot in Ibiza. Give me the European rights. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then I kept America and I said, and here's what he did. He took off all of the rock and roll hound, DJ hound dog music and he, replaced it with the latest club hits and because he was very connected in the scene and he started opening the movie in nightclubs like Pasha. <laughs> so the film was actually playing in, in the biggest nightclubs and I was kind of like, I was really torn about it because it, it lost the integrity of the movie. But I was trying not to get in my own way. You know, I'm like, shit, I'm sabotaging myself all the time. You know, let, let's just see what he can do. So, you know, he opened it and it was released in this country and that country and different DVD releases. And, you know, I let it go. So I never released it. And I always had this sort of like, ah, fuck, it's just not my movie. <laughs> you know, mm. it's like, ah. And, um, and then other things happened and I just kept sitting on it all this time until... I felt like, fuck, especially this coronavirus. I'm sorry, I'm swearing, but I'm like, dude, I gotta, I, I can get it out there now. Amazon, everybody can watch it. So I, it gave me the, the impetus. And so you say, what's it like? Let me tell you. It's like I just finished the movie. 
I've just watched it a few times and I'm I'm in love with it. I'm in love with the performances by the my the leading ladies. There's four of them. They're all incredible. The moments I feel are their their moments are incredible. I mean, they're it's they're so, it's a very you know for people who haven't seen it yet. Of course, it's. I was trying to create a, a, the sense that it was real. It was all happening. So it's very cinema verite. Yeah. The performances of, uh, are, you know, they are scripted, but there's a degree of improv in there as well. There's some fluidity. So they don't feel, it doesn't feel scripted at all. And, um, and there's a lot of real emotions that are coming through. Um, there's, I love the scene, the dildo scene in, around the table. Yes, there, yes, there is a dildo scene in the <laughs> right. film, um, but the movie. You're right that that sort of uh, cinema verite it reminds me of like that. Uh, I, I, it reminds me of sort of French New Wave, like in that early. It's it's like we're just hanging out with you, mm -hmm. right? And the, yeah. the and 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 that sort of that vibe is. Uh, you get to do a lot of fun things, so it's you're not a bad guy to hang out with. I know that from also knowing you, you know, uh, outside of talking to you on a podcast. So um, you definitely know how to make an entrance. Well, so the movie is now on Amazon Prime. I feel like there's also a whole Amazon Prime presents a, a whole interesting opportunity for filmmakers because, um, and I'm not saying like they're not the only game in town. There are other there are other types of distribution distribution pathways but you won't have more access than amazon based on the user base you know 130 million registered users uh from the united states like on amazon that's like you know almost half the population of the u.s something can happen i mean a film can go viral and I, I i think this is really interesting it's only been dawning on me in the last few days you know like a, a song can go viral because Predominantly, people are listening to to music on Spotify and Amazon and what what have you. So nobody's paying to go out and buy a record. They're just like, oh, you know, play this, you know, whatever, or it's in a playlist. And um, you know, we've obviously had things go viral through the social media, Facebook, and this and that. But film has always been a barrier to entry. Netflix is starting to have films go viral. So for example, they, they had this erotic thriller playing recently that rose to number one, and then about for three weeks. And then a, a week later, Gaspar Noe's love rose to the top of their charts. Because- Why? It, it, well, because suddenly everybody was watching an erotic films and, and, they're, and they're seeing it as a recommendation to come up in their search, right? So a movie that was actually, you know, very edgy and kind of semi-obscure suddenly reached a much bigger audience simply right. the algorithms. And um, so, you know, that's now possible. You can make it happen if you use Prime. And if you put a price on it, unfortunately, you're getting in the way of the uh, that opportunity. Right, right. I keep I pay for independent movies to watch them on Prime uh, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm maybe I'm the only one, but I'm just like constantly shelling out. I'm like, <laughs> you know, but I I think that it, I think that it's um, we as independent filmmakers and micro budget filmmakers, right? It's very difficult unless we brought in a big star to create that sense of you know urgency. To, to get somebody who's never really heard of it to pay, to pay money. And so do we really want to take the fraction of people that are going to go, okay, I'll shell out in a, in a world where they're used to getting everything for free, right, with, with subscription? Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, you, you, you froze uh, again. John, this is uh, this is the frustration of the times we live in. I guess I'm gonna um, I'm gonna hopefully you'll come back, and we'll continue the conversation um, uh, about about your film. But um, and this isn't by any means like an endorsement of of um, Amazon Prime. But I do find myself um, when when the app sort of like reaches the top, you know, of mind for me, I find myself 
discovering a lot of things. Um, if you're still, if you're still, if you're still there, John, um, try to leave and come back. Uh, and, or maybe we can do a part two to this, this conversation. Uh, but John Jacobs, I want to thank you for being on the film threat podcast. Uh, that was a blast. Uh, make sure to check out his film, DJ Hound Dog. It's on Amazon. It is now free to stream if you have Amazon Prime. Uh, and and it's a uh, oh here's John, here. John. I don't know how that happened. But... I don't know how it happened. I don't know. How it... You you had you had like you know what's so funny? You actually wrapped it up with a good point. I was going to end the show, but um I, I guess we can end it right now. But John, thank you so much for being on the Film Threat Podcast. This will not be the last time um, that you'll be you'll be doing this. Um, we are going to do. Here's what I think we should do. I think we should do a watch party for DJ Hound Dog. So sometime in September, go to the, go to Film Threads Facebook page. Um, I'm not sure if we came up with a date for that. Are we? What are we doing? September 25th. Whatever. Yeah, the whatever you you just let me know. I think it'd be great fun and uh, yeah, let's see what it's like as a you know shared experience. It's on. Okay, we're gonna do it. Right. We're gonna do it. So sometime in later in September, we're going to be doing a watch party. Uh, for DJ Hound Dog, which is going to be a blast, and and go to the Film Thread Facebook page or follow us on anything social media, and you'll see. Um, I want to thank John Jacobs for being on the Film Threat Podcast. It was a blast. My apologies for our technical issues, uh, but we will be back. We'll be back because I'm doing this every day now. Because why not? And there are too many good filmmakers to talk to. So thanks for watching and or listening to the Film Threat Podcast.